Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the No Laying Up Podcast. Solly here, got an interview coming shortly with Ken Green, someone that we had mentioned in a recent Masters or Majors recap as someone that we should track down and interview. Um, we did track him down and interview him. He was known as a bad boy on the tour, and we detailed a lot of the, the finds that he encountered. He, he revels in telling so many stories. Uh, I got to say, when I set out to uh, you know research Mr. Green, I was very unaware of some some heavy details about his past. Uh, this podcast episode is going to start with a lot more of the fun-loving stuff, uh, and I'm going to cut in later in the episode to add a bit of context around uh, a story about his childhood that's quite difficult for him to tell, and uh, he it'll make sense when you get to it. Uh, again, when you hear a cut in, it is not an ad break. It is uh, an editorial note that I'm going to make later on, kind of introducing uh, some of the subject, which was extremely difficult for him to discuss, but it is uh, a topic that he has written about in his book and has written about in Golf Digest. Uh, it was just hard to understandably hard to get all the details from him when we do discuss it later on. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Roback Activewear. You all know Roback, best fit, best feel. They are fresh off new restocks of our favorite polos, hoodies, and Q-zips. There is not better gear for when you're playing golf or just out and about. The fit, the feel, the quality, it's perfect. They have just so many options with their performance polls. I just love going to their website and just looking around. Uh, we're getting pretty close to having almost everything uh, that they have on their website in my closet. They, their polos fit way better than boxy polos do. They have the best designs paired with the best polos. They have great, great performance hoodies. Uh, my favorite hoodies to wear. The fabric is so soft, I cannot take them off. I wear them on the course, off the course, wherever. The Q-zips are great. Wore it today while playing around a golf where I shot about a million, but I looked great. I felt great. They're versatile. They have me uh, feeling good and looking good. And if you haven't already, time to load up on some Roback for yourself and for others. Code NLU at Roback.com for generous 20% off your first order through the end of this week. That's R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. That's 20% off bottoms, Q-zips, hoodies, and more with Code NLU. Get ready for the golf season with Roback. So I'm 37. I started covering golf in 2014. Uh, I'd like to think I know a fair amount about it, but some, you know, some historical deep dives have led us into hearing just a bit of your story and, and preparing for this. I got to say, I was not fully prepared of what I would go on to learn about your life. And we're going to cover a lot today, but I want to start with where does, where does your golf story begin? Well, I guess, you know, in a uh, strange world, my mom decided to move us to Honduras, uh, which, you know, when you're 11 years old, you just assume Honduras is a city just down the road. But basically she did that, hoping that my father would get his stuff together. He was a really bad drinker, hoping that less people he knew, maybe he could, he could, he could beat the drinking, but uh, he couldn't. But, you know, I, I, it woke me up to a lot of things, it's, you know, some bad and some good, but it's a strange place to go when you're when you're 11 years old why honduras and how, when does golf enter the picture there did you did you learn golf in well, honduras i think honduras because that's where the job was he's a principal of an american school and really the the main reason i got into golf is because they wouldn't let me play any other sports because i was i was american so they joined a little nine hole well it was the only golf course nine hole golf course and and so i basically spent my days there and then just kind of fell in love with it it's kind of helped me survive uh the bad things that did happen and and uh it was a win-win you know little did i know it was gonna save my existence as a you know a good person or but i've loved golf ever since so when you, you start developing golf skills when you're in Honduras, you move back to the States um, as a teenager, and you, you turn into a professional golfer rather quickly, uh, as I understand it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, it was I, – I, I knew I was going to be in the business, whether it was going to – you know, when you're 16 years old or 15 years old, you don't really know if you're going to make it. You know, a lot of kids say they want to be professional, you know, football players or basketball, or baseball, you know, I was going to be in golf, whether I was going to make it on the tour. I had no idea, but if I didn't, I would have been a club pro of, of, of something. Golf was my existence. So when I got, I hate to use the word, you know, done with school, so to speak, college, uh, I left after three years. I thought it was time to go find out whether I had a chance to, you know, survive and make it in golf or, whether I was going to have to go into the club world. 
Can you give us an idea of what the pro golf landscape looked like? I mean, again, we're in 2024 mm -hmm. now. It's There's money flying everywhere. There's video of all kinds everywhere. It's just every resource possible at our fingertips. Yeah, but I'm guessing your edu the education process on the pro golf world had to be entirely different back then. You, I mean, yeah, it's a, definitely idea? was a different world. It, it, yeah. uh, there really wasn't a whole lot of places to play, you know, me tour wise, where now they have them all over, you know waiting for that dreaded Q school, which for viewers, it's once a year. And, you know, you got to get yourself ready because most of us are young and you really haven't developed into the golfer that you will be. And it was, there is nothing more nerve wracking than Q school. You can say, you know, win in the open or the pup for the U S open or the masters. I, I, there is, it is crazy. I'll give you a quick story. We're in, uh, it was six rounds back in those days. And we're in Palm Springs playing La Quinta. And I was kind of a stupid, aggressive player. I would be perfect for today's world. You know, back then wasn't so smart because your missus sent you off the planet. The 17th hole there was a really tight hole. I mean, we're talking just zoom. And most everybody was hitting irons and then they would hit you know, it shot over water. I hit driver and just smoke it right down in the middle. And I'm, you know, just got to finish par par and I'll get my card. And I do my yardage and it says, you know, 165. And I'm like, man, it just looks a lot closer. I do my yardage again, 165. And I'm like, that's nah, just not right. Something, you know, you just know something's not right. And I'm like, well, all right. I did it one more time. Got this 165 again from a different sprinkler. But all right, 165 it is. So I pulled out uh, a six iron, which is back then, that's what it was, you know, not a nine iron like today. But And I probably hit the worst shot I've ever hit in my life. Just, I mean, I laid the sod over this puppy and, you know, I'm disgusted. I'm banging the, you know, this. And I look up and, and the pin is in the very back and it somehow carries the water, which doesn't make any sense. I'm telling you, I didn't hit this more than 130 yards. And it literally rolls up to about 15 feet. And as it turns out, I end up making the putt. And then now, like, I'm like, well, this can't be right. I know what, you know, I mean, it was a sod buster. And I redid the yardage and I, I got 135 this time. <laughs> and it just goes to show you how the nerves can, can really play in your head, which means I carried that six iron. It was 105 to the, to the front. So I only hit my six iron 106 yards and it rolled the rest of the way. That's how bad I hit it. Uh, I make it. Bob Tway finishes double bogey, triple bogey and missed it by a shot. It's just, you can't explain to viewers uh, how crazy the, the, uh, the Q school pressure is. So you, you go straight to the tour. Like, do you feel, are you ready for it at this point? Do you, is your game ready or do you, what, what, what? What's the well, learning you know, process like? You're not. You're not ready. You know, uh, very few are. Again, back then, because it was a slower progression. Whereas now, because of the equipment, guys get better faster. So you know, they're 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 little mini studs at 16, 17 years old. You know, when they get to college, they're they're turning into studs. Where you know, our progression was a much slower process. You know, I got out on tour and. And, you know, it was a, whoa, these guys are way out of my league. I mean, you know, I think I played 14 or 15 events and made seven cuts. Thought I was a, just a waste. But, it, you know, so I had to go back to Q school. And it was at that Q school. And this time it was at TPC Sawgrass where, they, where Scotty just blew everybody's mind. And that's when I realized how much better I was because Q school was now, I don't want to say easy, but the, how I handled it pressure wise showed me how much I did learn, even though it was a bad year, I, how much I did learn. And then, you know, I've been, you know, played the tour for the next, you know, 18, 19 years. When, when you got out there, who did you see that, that amazed you or what did you see out there that was like, okay, this is a totally different ball game. <laughs> well, you know, it was, the first year or two, you know, I was lucky enough to, to get paired with a couple of the players. And, you know, it was like, wow, they're just, you know, Lanny Watkins and, you know, 
I uh, got to watch, you know, Tom Watson, and and it was like, it's, there, this is just out of my league. There's, you know, there's no way I'm ever going to reach these kind of this kind of level. But you know, even the guys that were, I hate to use the word mediocre, but you know, mediocre tour players, I guess is the the best way to label it, were so much better than me. And it was like, huh. But again, it's that you don't realize how much better you get every year. You learn, you learn. And even though sometimes you feel like you're going backwards, you're actually going forward. And, you know, it took me, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four years before I won my first event. And, you know, then I was lucky to win some more and all that. But it was crazy because I never realized how mental the game was. You know, when you're young, you're, you know, you're young, you're dumb. You're just kind of, you know, in my case, I was fearless and, and just went out there and played and, that's when I realized that, well, I'm watching some guys that are like stud muffins, you know, hitting the ball so much better than me, but couldn't keep their card. And, and it, it, it dawned on me. So it's like, well, it's, it's because as bad as I might've been upstairs in the noggin world, they were worse. And that's, that's the reason, and, you know, and, and to this day, I'm a firm believer that at a certain level, once we get to that tour level, the major difference between each golfer is how well they, uh, their course management and their faith in themselves uh, is the difference. Hmm. What would you say is, uh, what was your reputation like out on tour? What, uh, what, 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 what are you known for, as you say with a giggle? <laughs> well, I, you know, the strangest thing is, is I got this reputation as this, like a bad boy, and I never really could understand it because I only, I answered questions Yes. You know, I get asked a question. I gave you an answer. You know, to me, it was I wasn't being controversial. I wasn't trying to be controversial, but evidently I was. And I I tell my friends and stuff, I said, like, I think I'm holding back. I'm only really saying 50 percent of what I want to say and I'm getting crucified for it. And, uh, you know, and then once you start winning, then then, of course, you get more notoriety and and. Uh, I, I went on to be the tour's bad boy, you know, all the different fines and, and, uh, that's just who I was, I guess. Did you enjoy that moniker? Or did you play into it at all? You say well, it a little bit with no, a smile, I mean, but you know, my theory was again, I just, you know, I, I just want to answer questions. If you want to give me a question, I'm going to give you the answer. And I still believe that's the way you should do it. And you know, the tour is, is very controlling in the sense that, they basically want many robots out there, you know, and, and then you mix that with the sports psychologists that are so involved today that basically they are many robots. You know, they're not real big on emotions. They're not real big on answering questions with honesty, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's something I never could quite understand why, you know I mean? In my opinion, golfers, especially professional golfers, are the most honest people on the planet Earth. You know, they're calling penalties on themselves that you would never see in any other any other sporting event. But the tour wants you to act a certain way. And like, for instance, I'm answering this question and I'm going to tell you what I just did. And then I'm going to tell you that the tour has been run by three of the most dishonest people on planet Earth, starting with Dean Beeman. Tim Fincham and now Jay Monahan, and it's the complete opposite of who the, who the golfers are, and yet the guys on the top are questionable. I mean, they're they're just not they're just not honest people. Starting with with what uh, who was commissioner when you were on tour? What, in your opinion, what makes Dean Dean Beeman uh, dishonest, or what examples? Or what leads well, you to that the, conclusion? The, you know, the reason I became more aware of who these gentlemen were was I don't know. If you've ever heard of the ping square groove lawsuit, sure. I was obviously a ping player and I was the only name player to sign on with the lawsuit. And I felt very strongly about it, not, not to fight the tour or the USGA, but I just didn't think it was right that all of a sudden, you know, three or 4 million golfers who play pings have to go out and buy a new set of clubs. I mean, to me, that was inexcusable. And what, the powers to be didn't understand where square grooves hurt you as much as they helped you. There are certain shots they might have helped you, 
But then there's certain shots that the ball might have spun too much and, and spun in the air and, and ends up in the water instead of carrying. So, you know, the, the good and the bad of golf, just like every other aspect of golf. And, and then once the lawsuit happened, that's when, you know, Beeman and Fincham were not being honest to the players, you know, telling them that, you know, that Karsten is going to take over the tour. There's going to be no more PGA Tour. You're going to lose your jobs. And in that three-year period, three and a half, I guess it was technically, 27 of my 31 fines happened. So, you know, just put <laughs> put two and two together and you're going to get screw Ken Green. I mean, that's just how it works. Uh, I, I got fined on, on Tuesdays. I'm, I'm playing a practice round. It's me, uh, Cal Quebecium, Fred Couples, and Payne Stewart. We're playing at uh, 92 Belle Reve in St. Louis. And... We're waiting on the tee box, and, you know, it's a par three, so it's a, you know, they're waiting and waiting. So I go down and start signing autographs. And someone says to me, hey, what do you think of the course? So, you know, I'm signing away, and I go, are you a member? And he goes, no. I said, the course sucks. You know, and everybody laughed and, and all that. Well, an official just happened to be walking by, and boom, fine. Uh, on a Tuesday, I mean, you know, that's just... That's just how it worked when it came to me. I, I, I got, I got, I got nailed off. <laughs> well, I, I've also heard a story of, uh, in this time period as well, of uh, an incident that happened at the tour championship, uh, with you during this ping, uh, these ping days with the weather, uh, a weather delay, uh, Pebble beach. Does that sound right? Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I do. I do do a little, a little preparation for these. Yeah. Things. <laughs> uh, it was the very first tour championship at Pebble beach and a storm comes in out of nowhere. I mean, just, rain is sideways and it's windy now we all know the 10th hole of pebble a great golf hole i hit driver driver and i don't reach the green i'm about 12 13 yards short i pitch it up to literally uh, literally about a maybe 15 inches and there's an official there now it's just buckets and buckets and buckets and i'm like i go over and say you got you got to call this right i mean this is insane we can't even you know no 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 and I'm like, man, that makes, you know, so I get over the pot and I'm getting there and I put, and it just as I start stroking it, a huge gust that comes and kind of blows me away. And I, you know, I hit the pot. I missed the hole by about seven inches. That, that's how much I got no blown over. And then I tap the next one and the son of a bitch blows the whistle. <laughs> and so, you know, that they knew they were blowing and he was just being a, a pain in the ass, and I ended up uh, missing the playoff by one shot. Oh. Now, at this particular year, it was between myself, Tom Kite, and Curtis Strange, so who would be the first one to win a million dollars for the year. You know, not, not, not for a tournament, but for, for the whole year. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying I would have won the playoff, but, I, you know, I, you know, it just, uh, you know, people and human emotions get in the way, but you know, again, all because they were not being honest, you know, and you, you fast forward to Monaghan and he and, and the board wasn't honest with the players, you know, didn't, didn't give them a heads up on the, you know, on the live so-called merger and all this. I mean, just stabbed Rory in the back because Rory was basically the tour spokesman and look how he's done a 180. You know, he's gone from, they should not even be allowed on the planet to, I think they should be able to come back. And you can't tell me that's not because he got stabbed. And I'll give you another example with John Rahm. Uh, John Rahm was also adamantly not going to do it. And who knows what, besides the, you know, not telling the top players what's going on, who knows what they actually told Rahm. So he didn't just switch without a reason. You know, he may too felt he got stabbed in the back and he said, screw you. And, and, you know, then Monaghan and, and comes up with this, I have health reasons, you know, so no one's going to question, he, you know, he should have been fired immediately hmm. for that. And, uh, you know, I, I, I give him credit, you know, they pulled up, uh, you know, a good scam and he still has the job, but it's just wrong. You know, you shouldn't, it's, it's just too good a game to be, you know, playing all the shenanigans in, in the back door. 
Well, a big part in unpacking all this for me is just I keep coming back to the structure of the tour being a huge hindrance and leaving it vulnerable to, you know, there's 200 members, there's all these opinions, it's member run organization, it's not really designed with maximum media value and entertainment value designed, it's not what the charter, it's not what the, you know, the mission statement of, of the tour is, and it, it does seem like uh, and I, I, I want to relate this back to, you know, it seems just like an antiquated setup that never got fixed, corrected, modernized in some way. And it was kind of put into place around the time, uh, you know, a little bit before your time, but you were you're a part of this, you were a part of a tour that was a little, a way smaller scale. It was an event to event city to city kind of thing that was kind of strung together in one tour, but it wasn't massively sold as this big media project. And it just doesn't seem to really make sense to keep this kind of same structure to me, uh, you know, and, and have these massive television deals and try to create this entertainment product when playing opportunities is more important on the under, underlying level. I'm, I wasn't expecting to talk to you about this today, but you, you brought this up and I, I'm no. curious to get your, your input on that. Well, you know, it's, it's for instance, like, you know, the tax credit that they get that they're so-called eligible for, you know, pretty much every legal mind I've ever talked to said, you know, this is what, how things were done back in the day. You know, they kind of scratched their back and there's no way they should have this as the other sports who have it. You know, they, you know, they just kind of looked at it and said, you know, they're good for the, for the game. They're good for the, you know, the United States, you know, again, whether it's football or baseball or any of these, you know, and since now you fast forward, the lift thing hits and now they're, they're branching out to a for profit. You know, it's it's a tough, into which I really can't honestly say I have an answer one way or the other. You know, I, I don't know all everything there is to, in terms of that part of of the tour and the structure. But that's why you get the the brightest brains and you get them together. And if we needed to make change, this should have been made a long time ago. Yeah. You know, and, and you know you have to you have to make change as 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 time flies by, that's just how it works in life. Yeah, it's way, way too reactive. I mean, this, this, this threat was existing for a long time and, and nothing happened on that front, but that's a conversation for another, we could go down a whole different rabbit hole, but I, you, you mentioned this number 31 fines. I think you said, can you give us an example of, uh, of what are some of the things you get fined for and well, which ones you agreed quite, with and which ones honestly, were petty? I deserve some of them. I won't, yeah. I, won't, I won't deny that. I do deserve, I do uh, deserve some of them. For instance, the 92 U.S. Open was at Pebble Beach. And the greens had just rattled my brains. You know, there's, this is the day back in spike marks, and the greens were, you know, bumpy and fast and just really hard to putt. You know, not like, you know, they're much better now. But So I was well known for uh, depositing putters throughout the country and, and lakes and ponds and oceans. So I decided that I was going to unload this one. And so on 18, I become a much more mature person. I decided to go around, you know, the huge scoreboard that's there, the manual one. I go around it so nobody will see me. And then I just gave that putter the heave ho of the century. And the only person that saw me was the guy in the back of the scoreboard thing. And who was putting up the numbers. And wouldn't you know, he writes a letter in. And so I got fined. Now, the greatest, I believe, story, or, or although I didn't get fined for this particular one, was also at Pebble Beach. I finished on the ninth hole one year. This is when we're playing the at and Again, the greens had rattled my brain, and it was time for this putter and I to, to, to you know, divorce. So I go over to the edge of there, and I just... Another heave ho. Now it's a long way to the ocean. You know, you got to go over the beach and all that. And but I made it a good twenty yards into the ocean. It was a, an impressive throw. So the very next year, this couple comes up to me and talks to me. And says we'd love to have your autograph. I said sure. So they had this big uh, roll up poster. So and in it, there's this guy who's in the in the ocean. And he's got his hands up holding the putter that I had tossed the previous year. <laughs> he, he saw me do it. He went down to, down to the ocean. He said it took him 45 minutes to find the putter. But that, so that, that's probably my most memorable quote autograph that, that, uh, that I'll, I mean, I just won't forget. That is fantastic. And, uh, you know, I had, you know, this... uh, 
Uh, I don't know if you heard of the Arnold Palmer beer and the oh, Red yeah. Floyd story. I was just getting ready to say there's some. You, this was not not just unique to the PGA Tour. You did this was uh, at at the Masters as well. This one's at the '97 Masters, and as it would happen, I'd shot. Um, I'd accidentally. Well, I didn't actually. A friend of mine. I was watching them play basketball. We had rented a house, uh, and I I went out to to watch, and the ball rolled under the car. So I reached under to get it for him and a friend of mine came out and kind of kiddingly gave me a little bump and my thumb went right into the ball and broke the thumb. Um, so I shot 87. It was a bad, you know, I mean, I, I could play. It wasn't great, but I could play. And, and I, I was miserable. I shot 87. So I was going to withdraw thinking this, this is crazy. You know, I can't play golf like this. And then I found out I was paired with Palmer and, and because of our ages, we had never played together before. And I really hadn't spent any time with them at all, except for, hello, how are you? And so to me, this was, you know, this was a perfect, I mean, this is, you know, when this was, you know, my idol growing up was, was Palmer. And uh, so we went out and, and played and I had a, I can't tell you how good a day I had that day. And, uh, you know, he's, he's telling me all sorts of stories and, you know, I'm asking him everything in the planet. So then on the, on the 15th hole, the round was coming to an end, and, and I had a friend go over and get me a beer because I figured this is my only chance that I'm ever going to have to have a, a beer with, you know, the king. I mean, he's the king. So I went over and said, Arn, this has been a phenomenal day. I thank you, and, you know, I just wanted to have a beer with you because I didn't know if I'd ever have a beer with you. And uh, he said, oh, you should have brought me one. I said, well, even I'm not that forward, but... <laughs> uh, so we get through and then I start telling that story. And, you know, then I mentioned weird things have happened every time I play with a superstar. You know, I said, you know, I don't know why it just has, whether, you know, it's Seve or, you know, I got the, the Jack Nicholas story was phenomenal. And, and uh, you know, I said that, you know, the Ray Floyd story was unique. He was, you know, he was a, I think my quote was, he was a dirt ball to play with until he cheated and then he was great. And, I said that without even thinking, you know, I wouldn't, because uh, trust me, he's not a cheater, but he took a, a bad drop because he was pissed one in, in Miami. He literally didn't say a word to us for, for 10 holes uh, and then hit the shot to the par five and pull hooks it and never even sniffs carrying the water. He ends up dropping up there. I'm playing with a, a great friend of mine, Bob Boyd, but you know, we're, we're like rookies, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going to. We're the very first group up on Sunday. Floyd is pissed because that's his fifth major because he was, you know, that's where he lived. And, you know, for him to be in the first group on Sunday, he's miserable. And, uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't have that in my head back then. I'm 23 years old or whatever. So, I, it, you know, I didn't put two and two together. And he, my, my friend is just besides himself. You know, it, it, he's got a Southern, uh, He's from the Carolinas. So he's got this Southern accent. And he goes, Rank, Rank, what are we going to do? The Masters, PGA Champions, Chain Greens, Chain. It's like, oh, I don't know what the hell we're going to do. I mean, that's, and, and it's amazing. My friend is so rattled, he shanked his wet shot. No way. So he makes the seven. Floyd hit it up there about 50 feet and he makes the putt. So he makes the par. So, you know, we're. My friend is is about to lose his marbles. So on the next hole, Floyd hits it in there about six feet and three jacks it. So, so now we're walking up the little hill to the next tee, and it's Bob, Ray, and me. And without looking at me or anything, he, he just goes, goes, deserves the blank, blank right for cheating. And I was like, oh, boy. <laughs> So now we're in the middle of the fairway, and I think the light bulb probably went off on Ray, and he probably looked back and goes, "Oh, you know, I, maybe I did, maybe I didn't drop right or something." But, uh, and then he was like nicest guy in the world for seven holes. So that's I, that's what I meant. Not that I wasn't calling him out for cheaters. He's not. You know, he just made a dumb mental. You know, he was pissed error. Uh, but you know, the savvy thing happened in the mat in the '89 Masters. Where he tried to, well, he literally tried to cheat. 
We'll take us. Oh. Yeah, assume that we don't know these stories because these are some of oh, these are okay. new to me as well. well. 89 so. Masters is uh, we're in the third or fourth, the last group. We we have a chance, but we have to play a great round. You know, well, seven plays flawless. I mean, just flawless. Plays shoots 31 in front, and now he's tied for the lead. And he he overcooks it on 10 and, and overhooks it left, and so. I was curious as to if he had a shot. So I walked down that way and I got there and his ball's in a little mini rut like this. And I'm like, well, he's got to pitch out towards me. So I, I walked down towards my ball and I'm looking back, waiting for him to hit, you know, pitch it out. Well, all of a sudden I see him dropping. I'm like, dropping, what's he dropping for? So I will walk my little butt all the way back up there and I don't know if most people are aware of this, but the Masters has a rules official on every every hole. So I got there, and immediately the official says, well, you may not know this, but here in Augusta, we have this uh, rule, local rule called uh, crowd damage. If we feel uh, your lie has been affected by crowd damage, we can give somebody a drop. And I was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> this isn't getting the drop. And the only reason I knew this is because on the second hole, I had gone for the green and pushed it where people were, and it was wet. It was a wet Masters, so it was all mud and mild, you know, just crusted little holes. My ball went in one of those holes, and I tried to get a lie, and I wasn't given one. And it was clearly crowd damage, but I wasn't given one because, well, well, it's honestly because I was kind of green. So I said, no, I want, I want another, I want another roll. <laughs> you know, this is. So we're waiting and waiting, and then. Sebi looks at me and goes, Ken, you can go. You know, it's not like I'm going to cheat or anything. And I just said, ah, I'm not so sure about that, Seb. You know, so now the crowd was like, ooh, ooh, you know. And so we waited, and the official, uh, Michael Balalik, Bal 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 I think his last name was, uh, president of the RNA and all that, he got, he got within 10, 15 feet of it. He said, put it back. You know, that's just who Sebi was. I mean, Sebi knew it wasn't crowd damage, but he also knew he had a way with people and he would, he would try to intimidate you. And, you know, so that's how it was. And then, so then he punched out and he kind of just kind of lost it. You know, never, you know, that was pretty much it. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things. It's just weird things happen when I play with superstars for the first time. And what, what was the Jack Nicholas story then you referenced? Oh, that was a good one. Jack was, this was 1982, uh, my very first year on tour. And I had qualified for my very first U.S. Open. And it's too, ironically, was at Pebble Beach. So I had, I had signed up as the four of us were going to go out and play. So we put our name down here. And so we show up and um, somehow there's five of us. I, I don't know who, one of us screwed up. I don't know which one. So I just said to these guys, I said, listen, you guys, you guys go ahead. I'll, something will happen. And the, uh, the starter there says, geez, Mr. Green, you know, the, the sheet's full. So, well, we'll see what happens. We'll, you know, we'll go from there. And so I'm waiting and I'm waiting. And then all of a sudden it was like a mob of people just all over the place on the first hole. And I'm like, holy, what the hell is this all about? Well, all of a sudden I see this guy kind of pushing people away and this and Tom Weisskopf walks out. And I go, oh, Tom Weisskopf. That, you know, okay, Tom Weisskopf. And then, and then all of a sudden, I just see people themselves just move out of the way, like Moses was coming or something. And it was Jack Nicholas. I'm like, oh, Jack Nicholas. <laughs> you know, just, and so Jack says hello to the starter. And the starter says hello. And he says, uh, the starter says, do you have a tea time, Mr. Nicholas? And Jack says, no. And the starter says, well, you're on the tee. You know, and I'm like, okay, that you know, it's Jack Nichols. He deserves that. I, I'm, you know, that's good. And then all of a sudden, he goes, uh, "Excuse me, Mister Nicholas, uh, young Mister Ken, you know, Ken Green is looking he, for a time. Would you mind?" If, and I'm like, "No, no, no, no. I do not want to play with that. No. <laughs> and you know, Jack was said, "Yes, absolutely." Uh, my knees were literally shaking. All I could think about on the tee shot was, "Please don't let Jack see that my knees are shaking." Because they were, they were shaking. It was, I, I was petrified. Had an absolute blast with him. He was wonderful. He couldn't have been nicer. And uh, on the 15th hole, he disappears. We're playing 16. 
Uh, and we go to 16T, and I'm like, Tom, are we supposed to continue? Where'd he go? Bah, screw him. Who knows where he went? Okay. <laughs> so we hit off, and then just as we're getting off the tee, he comes up, and he's got uh, four peach ice cream cones in his hand, which was peach ice cream was his flavor. And he knew that there was an ice cream stand there that sold the peach ice cream. So I thought that was pretty wild that Jack Nichols bought me an, an ice cream cone. So now, now we've got, you know, probably 5,000 people watching us. We get to 18, and Tom hits a bullet. Jack hits another bullet, a little left of Tom. And they're out there in the fairway, and uh, Tom's over the ball. And he looks at, Jack looks at him, because I'm standing next to Jack. And he looks at him and says, hey, Tom, Eagles for dinner. And Tom says, Sure. He gets over the ball and then he backs off and goes, wait a minute. You have your whole you have your whole effing family here. And, and Jack just smiles and Tom says, fine, I'll do it. And Tom hits this great shot. He had like 255 to carry, which again, back in those days was a nightmare. Sure. He, he flies it in the bunker, just misses. Well, Jack had 253. And, and he pulls out a one iron. I look at my caddy. Here I am, a, a rookie. And I'm. And I look at my caddy and said, what is he thinking about? He's got no chance of getting a one iron that far. You know, here I am telling my guy that Jack doesn't know what the hell he's doing. And Jack gets this one iron that I will never forget. This is what, 40 some odd years later. And this thing went straight up in the air, flew 254 and rolled up a couple and about 30 feet and he makes the pop. I, it just, it was, I mean, it was just, a, it was a magnificent day, uh, you know, and the great thing about, I got to play with Jack when it wasn't in a tournament, so he, you know, he could be kind of himself versus that, you know, laser focus that, that, that you have sometimes in tournaments, and so that was wonderful, and then Palmer, I, I, you know, also, you know, technically it was a tournament, but we knew you know, it's not like we were going to do anything. So it was uh, the memories that I have for, you know, the 20 years that I was out there, and, uh, you know, whether it's the wins or the Ryder Cup or, or the stories like the ones I just told you are just, I mean, you, you couldn't ask for a better, better life. I mean, I know I've had a lot of ugly, bad, bad things happen in life, but I've had a lot of good things and I, I can't complain. What happened after the, uh, the, the beer incident at, at, at Augusta? Did you get reprimanded uh -huh. for that? And, and how, did you, well, how did you weasel out of that one? <laughs> yeah, I got I know this pretty one. hard. The, the max fine back then was 3000 and I, and, and, and I was going to get suspended. But I had, I had a friend write in uh, saying it was a non-alcoholic beer, so he rescinded that portion of the fine, but I still got the 3000 fine because I, the tour has this vague rule about conduct unbecoming and they felt that I, you know, I belittled another player and, you know, but again, it was, it was during the, the peak of the, uh, of the lawsuit. So I, I got nailed whenever I wanted. Mm -hmm. I remember I played in Japan and I sat down with Lanny and, and Craig Stadler. Uh, now we know Lanny had a pretty good, reputation for, you know, slamming the clubs and all that. Stadler would, you know, he'd bury him in the club, in the ground and all that. And, you know, here I'm getting these fines left and right. And this was the same year that I got fined for a practice round. I wanted to find out how many fines they had, had you know, received over all the years. I figured they were up there pretty good. And uh, Lanny looks at me and goes, what are you talking about? I've only been fined once. I'm like, well, what do you mean you've only been fined once? And he goes, yeah. He says, but I deserved it. It was my own fault. I broke a T marker. And I'm like, wait a minute, let's get back to you've only been fined once. And and I was just stunned. So then I look at, at Stads, like figuring, all right, you know, he's the one that really buries the clubs in and bangs them. And how many times you've been fined? I've never been fined. <laughs> I was like, well, what do you mean you've never been fined? What are you talking about? You guys are like two of the hot heads out here, and then you have one fine? At that time, I was like a number twenty-eight or whatever it was. But it's uh, you know, it's I, I again, I, I go back to I can't complain. It's it's been a great ride. Hmm. 
Well, surely that's the only stunt you ever pulled at Augusta, right? There's nothing else you would have ever, uh, ever tried I, I've at Augusta. I've got some good ones at Augusta. Uh, ironically, that same year, 1989, for those people who don't know, you get um, so many family passes, which were eight, and then you could buy eight. So you're, you're allowed basically 16 passes. And you get eight of them when you get there. And then the family passes are sent to your home. And... I had played the week before, so my wife was going to meet me at Augusta. Uh, now, for the first time, she had uh, a third of them were her family members to come in for the first time. Well, we ended up having some sort of argument, which I couldn't even tell you what it was about. And she decides she's not coming. Oh, I'm like, all right, fine. If you don't want to come, don't come. That's all right. Just, you know, FedEx up the tickets. No, I'm not. I'm not doing it. What do you mean you're not doing it? Yeah, I, we got to have the. No, I'm not doing it. Well, every one of her members, family members tried to talk to her, and she wouldn't send them. Wouldn't send them. Wouldn't send them. So I finally get to the point where I know she's not sending them. So I decided to go in into the uh, office and just tell Hort Harden the truth. Figured, you know, he's married. We've all, you know, people have fights. So I go in there and, and just lay it all out, telling the truth, thinking, hoping. I said, you know, I, I'd really appreciate it if you could let me buy eight more. And I'll, I'll never forget it. And this is a quote. No, get better control of your wife. That's it. So now I'm screwed. I got, we got nothing. So the first day I sneak everybody in. I, we go back and forth in the car and we're, we sneak them in and how do you, where do you sneak them in? Where, where are they riding? Well, this, the, the first, first day they rode in the car, in the car in the seat like normal people. And I gave the, the, the eight youngest, I didn't give the tickets, figuring they had a better chance of moving around without getting caught. Well, her brother gets caught and he panics and he rats me out saying, I'm here with Ken Green. You know, instead of just saying, yeah, I snuck on and got caught, send me my way. And so now the next day, they search, they're checking all the badges when I pull, pull in. So now when I go back to get the other group of guys, because I had to make three trips back and forth, we're hiding them under the seat with blankets. We got a couple in the trunk and we, we just kind of move her in and we pulled it off. And, and it's, uh, but it was a great trunk, trunk escape. And it, uh, it was a unique story, but it's weird because considering that I've never won the masters, I've got a lot of weird stories and some people may know about, you know, when they watch the par three tournament on Wednesday, that uh, all the kids have the little bibs and they're caddying for, well, I was the first one to do that, but I got letters from Ward Arden and telling me not to do it anymore. You know, and now they have the kids doing it for everyone. I'm, they, actually the owner, of the bib company actually called me about three years ago and wanted to thank me because he knew I was the one that started this and he's, his company is flourishing because he has the bibs. And once, once you're have the, the bib company for Augusta, you get, you get everybody. Sure. So that was my one claim to fame. Uh, my next was uh, my sister was the first female caddy there. Mm. And she was the first female caddy on tour ever. Uh, and then the next is, uh, you've seen the skip shots they do on 16. You know, I think Rom had a hole in one, you know, a few years back. Well, I was the first one to start that. And I got letters telling me not to do it anymore. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of disappointed that I don't have a plaque somewhere. You know, a little little Ken Green skipper plaque or something. But it's... Uh, it, 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 uh, I, there's a lot of stories out of Augusta. <laughs> yeah, jeez, you got. I mean, we could. I don't think we can cover all your stories uh, that, that we have in in the time we have today. But take us back you, before. I guess I don't know when exactly this is. Sometime in the early '80s, I think it is. How you, uh, at, at some point in your career, either just to get started, but how you uh, uniquely finance some of your oh. early days on the PGA Tour. Well, the first few years, I had sponsors from my hometown who were, you know nice enough to put up some money and get me out there. And, but after the third year, you know, I hadn't, you know, I kept my card, but I wasn't, you know, really 
making money because, you know, the travel expenses. And back then we played for nothing. I mean, our, our purse, our whole purse was $300,000. I mean, think about that. Here I am in Florida in January trying to figure out where I'm going to get my money to start the tour. And I don't, I don't have, I, I don't have but maybe $2,000 in my name. And so I did what anybody would do when they're on their last row and hoping. And, and I know, literally know zero about basketball, but I started betting basketball games. And I, I won 23 out of 24 games. I mean, think about that. That's just stupid. And that's how I got started, you know, my tour and ended up winning a tournament that year and every, you know, never had a problem ever, you know, since it was just, I, I mean, you just can't think of it. 23 out of 24. Uh, it was in, insane. Just for those of those who don't believe in, in the little help from above, uh, I had to have help. help. <laughs> That's the only way I can look at it. That's incredible. That really is an incredible story. It just, it just was such a different time, man. I, I, I can't get enough of stories of that time of, of what the tour was like and, uh, and, and hearing all of those, but how did, uh, I guess just, I mean, we can't cover your whole career here, but how did your kind of career evolve? Where, when did, when did things like start not going well for you and kind of your transition into, into champions tour golf? I'm just kind of curious. I've heard you refer to demons a lot on the golf course and, and, and the mental side of golf. I'm just curious if you can kind of take me through some of the harder times well, out was, uh, playing pro golf. You know, like I said, it, it, it took a few years to finally, you know, you could say mature, understand the game, get a little better. Uh, you know, after my second year, I realized I needed some, some swing fixes and it, cause I'd never had a lesson in my life. And I, I tracked down, uh, Peter Casas, who I was his first student, uh, and it worked out great. And he helped me, you know, tremendously, uh, you know, and then, you know, one in 85, I won two events in 85, I won another one in 86 another one in 87, a couple in 88, another in 89, another one in 90. And, you know, things were great. And then uh, uh, went through a really bad divorce. Uh, she she played played with the games with the kids, unfortunately. And, and uh, that's where the demons came about when, you know, I, I had arrest warrants because, you know, I couldn't get enough money there. So I couldn't get back to the state. And, you know, that's where all the demons go when you're, you start pressing to make money. And, you know, it became a basket case and, you know, eventually fell into a massive depression and, and everything. And, and, you know, even, a, did, have you heard about suicide one? I, I don't know if I have. Yeah. Um, really bad depression. And, uh, so I decided I had enough. There was enough. It was enough. And. Um, I don't know how this happens. I literally took a whole bottle of pain pills and a bunch of other pills. And the rest of the story comes from my girlfriend. And, and we had a, a, a lab called Coco. And she, my girlfriend was sleeping on the couch. And she kept trying to wake her up and kept waking her up. And she kept pushing her away and pushing her away and pushing her away. And she, she eventually takes my girlfriend's shoulder and pulls her off the couch. Now, she's pissed at this point. So... The dog comes running in, jumps on me. And when Sue came in, that's when she realized something was wrong. So I'm real, I'm, I'm alive today because of what that dog did. But wow. you know, that's where, you know, the demons were there. I mean, I, you know, I'm a firm believer that everybody has them, but most of the time they don't come out, uh, you know, unless you're getting to these depressed states or, you know, ugly times was a lot of it because of the bad stuff that happened in Honduras. Uh, you know, I, I could talk to a, a therapist for for a year and, and I don't know if you get the right answers and, you know, all the different things that have happened. But golf is a brutally hard game. And if you have any any little mini demons in there, any thoughts that, that get you thinking of everything but the right things, you have zero chance in golf. And, and you know, that's that's pretty much what happened to me. That's pretty much why I lost my card. I don't, I don't think I lost my card. I think I was 43. You know, I probably, if I, you know, didn't have those demons and then the depression, I probably would have, you know, stayed another four or five years before the champion store, like, you know, any other of the good players that play the game. But it's, uh, 
and that, and that goes, to, you know, another story about the gambling and stuff. Now I'm basically broke again because of everything that has transpired. But so there's times when I had rest warrants and I went to Vegas one in, I was in between tournaments one year. Um, so I was good friends with the uh, Steve Wynn and, and Mike Pascoe's brother-in-law, more Mike. But, and I'm sure you've heard of Shadow Creek. Mm -hmm. Well, Shadow Creek back then was just stupid nice. I mean, you know, not many players. He, he only had this high rollers of high rollers that would play. So I was out there for a whole week. Did not place one bet because I didn't have any money to really bet. And, you know, I'm trying to make some money. But I did gamble on the golf course because... You know, you can control that. I felt like I, I could win. Well, I ended up winning $800 for the week. So the night before I leave, I decide I'm going to take that $800 and give it a whirl. You know, two or three hours later, I've got $105,000. Whoa. And, you know, everything was just going right. You know, you're playing blackjack and, you know, just boom, 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 boom. And... You know, besides winning the money, now I can, you know, I can pay the money I owed here and get back and see my son. And, and that happened two other times where once I got, I went and gambled and one time was, I, w I owed 27,000. And as soon as I got the 27,000, I stopped. And then there was another time that it was 18,000. And I've just, I've just been lucky. And, and to this day, I don't gamble because I feel like they've been so nice to me upstairs that I don't want to go. It's just part of, part of that wild ride that I've that I've that I've been on. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a, a truly insane ride. And if you, if you could detail or kind of take us to uh, in two thousand nine, you you have a you're living in a mobile home, I, th I believe at this point you've been there, living in that for several years, and you have a, a horrible accident. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us about that. Yeah, uh, well, to, you know, I just turned fifty, so you know, I was getting ready to play the senior tour and. and Got off to a decent start, you know, considering I hadn't really played competitive golf. You know, I don't know, I'd made 180 grand or whatever it was. And so, you know, this was the, this was my chance to get healthy again, you know, where we could have enough money to survive and all that. And, and we're actually coming back from a tournament. Uh, my wife was from Greensboro at that time. We were going from Austin to Greensboro. And we had stopped halfway. And then my brother was caddying for me and, and, and Jeannie and my German Shepherd Nick. Uh, which you can kind of see here. <laughs> that's a nip, sure, yep. the gator. That's another story. I went to the back to sleep. Uh, and the last thing I remember is hearing this boom. And I assume it was the, the tire blowing, the tire blew. And they just, just lost total control of an RV. And we went flying down this embankment and just crashed into the Mississippi swamp. And they were killed instantly. I must have gotten up because... I was thrown out of the front window. Most of my body went out one side of the window and my right leg went out the, the other side, uh, you know, where there's a, a, a pole in the middle. And that's, that's where I ended up losing my leg because it just pretty much shattered everything there. And uh, so we ended, we ended up having to cut the leg off. And it, uh, you know, obviously it ends the, the, uh, the senior career, so to speak. But, you know, it was... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a tough blow. You know, you lose you lose two people you love dearly, and, and uh, but you know, you, I'm a again. I don't know. You know, some people believe in God, some don't. I'm not a religious man in the sense of, you know, following certain religions and you know with all that kind of stuff. But I firmly believe, and you gotta you gotta decide. You know, either you live a pity party or you you get back up, you shake your head, and and you keep going. And, you know, you do whatever you can. And, you know, that was my, my hope. Uh, it was, it was a killer, you know, about six months later, I lost my son. You know, that one was, you know, you don't expect to lose someone that's 20 years old and your child and, you know, college booze and, you know, mixture of some drugs. And uh, that one hurt because, you know, you just, you don't, you know, you just don't. But, you know, again, you got to tell yourself, all right. Get back up, keep going. Get back up, keep going. Uh, you know, so that's what I'm. That's what I keep doing. And you know, I just, I just, I just, I just keep going every day. I, I try to do 
do what I can, you know, and, and, you know, if I can be a better person at the end of this year than I was last year, then, then I'm doing good things. You know, you, you gotta always, you gotta have a reason, you gotta have a purpose, whatever it is. And it's different for everybody, but you gotta have a, you, you gotta have a reason to do things in my opinion. And, you know, that's how I try to live, you know, and, and it's, uh, it's tricky. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of a disease called CRPS. Mm. Uh, I never had either. Uh, and unfortunately I contracted it from the accident. Uh, didn't get diagnosed until about three years ago properly. Uh, it's a nerve disorder and it's nasty. If anybody's bored and wants to read something, it is nasty. And so, you know, I'm fighting a lot of pain, but you just, again, you just, you, you just get yourself back up and you keep going. This next part of the podcast is uh, about what Ken revealed in his book in 2019 and also uh, what is excerpted in Golf Digest. The book is called Hunter of Hope. And uh, in the book, he details how he was sexually abused as a kid in Honduras. It's something that uh, he shared in the past and wanted to share to raise awareness, which we discuss in this interview, but it is obviously uh, and understandably quite difficult for him to talk about. He refers to some incidents here without detailing them, and I'm not going to lay out all the details that he has written about in the past, but I do want to add just a bit of context to what he's referring to before you listen. I think it will make more sense uh, once you do hear it. Um, summarizing it, uh, it's, again, a very awful topic and very difficult uh, to even summarize, but he was abused by several men beginning when he was 11 years old. They demanded that he not share the details of the abuse with his parents. They beat him. Uh, he had to lie to his mom about where welts were coming from. And uh, after two years of living in Honduras, his mother's relationship with his father was beyond repair. She set out and moved back to Connecticut. Uh, he was threatened by the men that abused him. Uh, and they were, he was told he needed to stay there or they would kill his father. Uh, again, he references this in what we're about to discuss, but the details are, are are obviously difficult for him to cover. The story goes on and on. It's awful. The abuse would take place when his father would be passed out from excessive alcohol use. And uh, he also refers to how his days in Honduras ended. Uh, and after a particularly gruesome attack, uh, he saw his attacker sleeping in his own bed uh, and picked up a rock and, quote, hit him with the rock as hard and for as long as I could muster the strength. Um, he obviously talks about this as well here in the in the coming part um it's of course very difficult for him so not all the details there are present but i hopefully hopefully this adds just a bit of context uh again incredibly difficult story to tell tough for him to relive difficult to hear difficult difficult for me to ask about but here is uh here is him discussing uh his, his time in honduras in 2019, I believe you wrote a book uh, about your life and about some of the things that, that you've gone through. Um, I, I want to start you know, a, a tough part of the conversation with just, and we'll kind of back into some of the, de the details that you that you shared in that book. But a big part of, of this was a secret you kind of held on to for, not kind of a secret mm -hmm. that you held on to for many, many years. First, I want to start with what, what has it been like since you came out with, with what you detailed in that book? And we'll get into the detail, but I'm first curious to, to kind of hear what what kind of release you've gotten out of this and what, what kind of progress has been made uh, maybe potentially in your life since coming out and, and sharing your, your story? Well, you know, it was, you know, people have been wanting me to, to, to write something cause I'd been such a wild run. And of course they didn't know about Honduras. I was, I was hesitant. I mean, you just, you know, I mean, it's, I know this part's going to sound bizarre and I was petrified about the idea that people would know some of the things that I had to do. And it wasn't about the ending when, you know, you know, the, the you know, I whacked them with, you know, with the, the rocks and stuff, but it was, I was more petrified about people knowing what I'd done you know, what I had to do and, and, you know, you're 12 years old and, you know, you just, I, I, that's what I was most petrified about. It's just, I, I, I was afraid that I'd be wondering and, and I'd be having conversations with people and I'm petrified even now. Are they thinking about what I had to do? You know, and I know that's warped, but that's, I mean, that's just the God's honest truth. And, you know, I, you know, you think back and you wonder, was I really that naive or that dumb? My father had a friend that, that lived with us, that went down to Honduras with us. 
And he's the one that first started with all the, the sexual games. And I, uh, you know, I, I look back on it and I'm like, what? Again, I'm, you know, like, how could you have been so dumb? You know, but he, I trusted him. I thought, you know, he basically told me that he was there to teach me and, and help me. And, and, you know, that was his job as, as being a close friend. And I, I believed every, I believed it. I, I didn't, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't until more people got involved and it got ugly and physical. And that's when I realized things were wrong. And my mom had left after two years and I was told I, I couldn't go home with her. I'll never forget the look on my mom's face when I told her I wanted to stay with my dad. Uh, I mean, it's been in my head for 50 years now. And then that year got awful, you know, and things just finally blew up one night. You know, it's not like I planned on anything. I, you know, it just happened what happened. And, you know, then I had to, basically wake them up. I'll never forget my, he put me on a plane the very next day. Uh, and you know, he used to call me kid and he's like, kid, I'm sorry. You did nothing wrong and don't ever tell a living soul. And I, I've kept it shut until I opened it up and it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm glad I did, even though I still struggle a little with it, more than I anticipated. Uh, but I have helped a lot of people. You know, they've, they've, you know, I've had conversations with other, other, you know, basically males, because uh, the, the males just aren't going to tell anybody. I don't know if it's just our, like our DNA, we just can't, it makes us feel, I don't know, but, it, you know, so many men don't tell anybody what's happened in, my, in their life. But, you know, I, I got to talk to a lot of them and, and, you know, a lot of them have, have opened up since they saw, you know, my interviews and stuff and since we talked. And so that part makes it good that you, you know, that you were able to do all that, you know, and, and it, uh, it just really, it's kind of warped how people are. How do you do that to a young kid? I mean... The, the Ken Green that I was supposed to be or going to be is never, you know, he's gone. You know, that changes you forever, you know, and it's, uh, you deal with it, but it's not, it's just, it's not right. I can only speak for myself in terms of, of my reaction to it. And at no point it was it, or uh, the immediate reaction was just sympathy. It was at no point of, uh, was it, how could you not know? How could you, the, the feelings you're feeling are not expected for a, any, uh, someone that age, you don't have world experience. Right. You don't know, like you just, you can't possibly know it at no point that I, you know, how could, was I thinking, how could you not know? It's just you, that, yeah. that was no, that. And every, everyone tells me that, but that's, you know, that's what, you know, one, it's such a, a vile situation when it gets done to, you know, the girls and the, and the boys that, and it's, uh, and it's way, it happens way too often. And because it is such a terrible topic, it's like nobody wants to talk about it or nobody wants to, to, you know, sit down and let's do something about this, you know, because it's, it's just too hard to, to, to think about and, and not enough is done. And, you know, I, I wish I could do more. I wish I had more power or, you know, fame or, or, or whatever you would need. I don't know, but, uh, it, it's, it's just wrong. It just, it's wrong. There's no other way around it. It really is. And not, the only thing I can speak onto this is you, you are doing something about it, right? You're raising awareness that, to me today, reading about it to, to everybody listening and to, you know, to, to be on the lookout for these things. I'm wondering if you have any, you know, organizations that you've worked with, uh, you know, since, since coming out with this, with this story or, or any ways people can get involved to help in any way. Yeah, there's, there's, a, you know, it's weird because I've, I've actually tried to get involved and, uh, I really thought that there would be an organization that would say, Hey, you know, not that I'm famous, but I'm, 
I'm more famous than, than most that go through this. Let's put it that way, you know, and why not? Let's, you know, but I, I haven't really been able to lock in with anybody yet. Uh, I'm still hoping because I, you know, I, like I said, I would love to try to, you know, get some new laws passed and, and, you know, we're living in an age now where we're giving everybody even bigger breaks to do, do illegal things. So, uh, you know, I don't even know what they would consider, but, uh, you know, the, the punishment should be a lot harder than they are. I mean, you'll, you'll never stop it a hundred percent. I get all that. But if you make some of the punishments hard enough, those guys, then it's mostly guys that are on the edge of, of doing that. to young boys and, and girls, you can stop a lot of them. If the crime is, if the punishment's bad enough and you know, I'm not saying it's akin to murder because you're still alive, but like I said before, you're not the person. You're 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 not you. Whoever you are going to be is gone. Yep, your life is forever changed because of that. Well, I appreciate you uh, you sharing your story about that as well. And you you mentioned a, a story I wanted to make sure we we got as well. The the, the what's on your shirt about your your dog. This is uh, oh, the, yeah. a, a story that's been been told over the years. But for those that aren't familiar, yeah, uh, with your dog Nip, see, yeah, you know that's a gator and a dog. Uh, Nip, the, the, talking about a, a, a dog that's gone through a hard time herself. The dog I lost in the in the accident. We were playing a uh, ball in the backyard and I, I uh, threw up, I hummed a, a racquetball and she jumped up to get it and it caught her canine and, and literally flew about 30 yards into the middle of the canal. Now, the, I, I've lived there 18 years and I've seen one gator and he might've been about this big. It was just, you know, there was never any gators there. And so I'm like, uh, you know what? She's due for a bath because the canal water's dirty. So I, you know, I snapped my fingers, which meant she could go get it. So she comes back at me and starts off, takes off running, you know, leaps over the, the five foot fence, just flying, you know, runs a few more yards and just takes this big jump into the canal, makes this big splash. Well, literally one second later, there's another splash. And I was like, oh my God, please tell me that's not what I think of this. So now I go running and I'm at the edge of the water now. And here's... I've got Nip swimming with the ball in her, in her mouth, and this gator is coming from the other angle. And I'm like, oh boy, what am I, how am I gonna do this? My, my original thought was, if I can run and jump, maybe I can reach the gator and, and you know scare it or whatever. Well, I didn't, I don't know why I didn't, but I didn't. So then I waited to see if Nip could avoid her or something, and, and the gator got her. Uh, and disappeared and I jumped in the water and I'm neck high and I'm waiting maybe it could have been 30 seconds it could have been 60 I really don't know how long it seemed like an eternity and there was no movement you know I'm, I'm expecting you know some you know and and then out of nowhere about 20 feet from me uh, the gator's tail and back pop up and she's drowning nip with you know with her where they're uh, your jaws. So I literally walk at a slow pace to get there because I didn't want to startle anything. I literally got within inches of the of, of the gator trying to figure out what to do. My first thought was maybe I could reach around the stomach and just hold on and, and hope. But the gator was too fat, it was too big. I'll never forget the size of his, of his back right foot because that's what I was right on top of. And so I decided, all right, I'm gonna reach around the, the tail and I'm going to punch him in the stomach and just hope I, I did not have a plan. I was just winging it. And all I remember was he, she lets go of the dog her mouth comes up you know, wide open and comes flying back at me. And obviously couldn't reach cause it doesn't have the flexibility. But as soon as it hits the water, we go into the, this massive roll. And I don't know if I held on for two or 10 based on the, all the, the cut marks and the, and the, bruised ribs I had. I, I held on a long time. I'll give myself credit. And then finally I pop up. Now I'm swimming at this point and I'm looking all over the place. A nip is almost at the water and literally about 15 feet from me, the gator's just looking at me. And it was like, I don't know why it didn't come after me because it had me. I had no chance. And I just started swimming towards nip and uh, rushed her to the, to the emergency clinic and 
two days. She almost died from the water when she was, you know, being drowned. Ended up with about uh, 26 or 7 stitches. Uh, but everything went our way. I mean, if the gator had just slid in the water without making a noise, she would have been dead. If the gator doesn't get her exactly in between her feet and her back feet, you know, she would have been dead. And then if the gator comes back at me, I would have been dead. And everything went our way because this, this was a big boy. So it was, uh, you know, again, whether you believe in upstairs or, or potluck, it's, it's up to you to believe. But it, uh, somebody, somebody was helping me out. Wow. Well, I don't know how to transition out of uh, a lot of the, the stories that you've just told us, but uh, you got to play in my favorite golf event, which is the Ryder Cup 1989 yeah. at the Belfry. Take us take us back to like that time period. Take us back to what the Ryder Cup was like then. It's a huge commercial event now, and everybody well, plays I mean, on the same tour. But it's it's different gotten a, a, you know, a little crazy, you know, and, and again, so the, the love of money, you know, they have too many people out there. Uh, and it's too many people to watch just four groups and it's a corporate show and, you know, it's about money. You know, it wasn't that way back then. I mean, to a little a bit it was, but you know, what I tell people is players like each other now, you know, they they know each other, and, you know, they're all buddies, you know, they're still grinding, you know, their tails off. But when I tell you that there was about five of our guys that despised five of their guys and vice versa. You know, the, the, the follows and well, no follows didn't play, but you know, you had Langer and, and Seve and, and uh, Sandy Lyle, you know, you know, those guys. And, you know, we had our Curtis Strings and Laney's and Tom's that weren't real thrilled with those guys. So it was, it was intense. It was, it was, what I try to explain to people is if you can imagine the last nine holes of trying to win a tournament, you know, where, you know, that pressure jumps up. Literally at the Ryder Cup, it's every day, you know, right from the get go on the on that first tee on Friday, you get that feeling of, whoa, this is intense, and you know, but as golfers, that's what you love. I mean, uh, I you know, I had a, a blast. I I was uh, thrilled with the way I played. I played really well in three matches. Played like a pig in the, in, in the uh, fourth match, and it was tight. We ended up tying which I don't like. I don't know what you think about it, but I don't understand the tie. And in, in the team that won it two years ago gets the credit. I mean, I, either call it a tie or have a playoff, damn it. You know, stop pussyfooting things around. It, it just makes no sense to me. But uh, the intensity was something that I'll never, I'll never forget. It, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm lucky to have been a, a part of it. And, I, I really wish I had been a part of more, but that's, you know, things started falling apart for me from that point. But it's, uh, it's a treasure I'll, I'll never, never, ever forget. What do you, what do you remember about that, that team room or some of those guys you got to play with? What, you know, you obviously get to see a different side, your teammates with guys like Paul Azinger and then, you know, Tom Kite, Mark Kalkovecchia, right. guys that you're friendly well, you know, with. It's funny yeah. because some of the stars didn't know me. And, you know, again, because of my reputation, we're, they, they didn't go out of their way to know me, you know, like, you know, like Lanny and Tom and, 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 uh, both Toms, Watson and, and Kite. But I, I played golf all the time with, with, uh, Calc and, uh, Payne Stewart, you know, and, and those guys. So, I mean, I knew some of them, but I didn't know others. And, uh, we were in the, in the, uh, our little player room kind of introducing ourselves or telling some stories and, and it was like, uh, you know, I remember getting up and, you know, it's like, well, some of you know me, some of you don't. And I don't know what to know and what you've heard, but it's, uh, you know, and then three or four of them said, well, we don't know about you either. And we're not sure we want to know about you. <laughs> it's like, but it was, uh, it was fun. It was, it was because we're single all the time, you know, we're, we're grinding it out ourselves. It's good to have that release where you're, you're with you're with somebody, you know, you're fighting for a reason, you know, in our case, it was, you know, the country and, and the Ryder cup, but it's, uh, it's just something you'll never forget, you know, and, and, you know, some of the couple of the guys I ended up, you know, getting closer to, and then a couple others are pretty much didn't know them again. <laughs> it's, it's just, you know, just how it works. Cause relations between the two tours, they weren't exactly chummy at that time. If I, if I understood right. No, now. well, yeah. see what people don't remember is, 
uh, one of the reasons we didn't like each other because we didn't think they were being very uh, cooperative is we felt that they should play a minimum tournaments and they wanted to be able to come over whenever they wanted. And so that was the big fight, you know, should they have to play 12 events, which, you know, back then, you know, the majors counted and there was and the TPC counted. So they really only had to play seven events. So in our mind, we couldn't understand why you can't come over here and play seven times, you know, the week before a major, two weeks. It's not like you want to just fly over for the majors. Uh, and then, you know, egos, you know, back then it was a clash of, you know, who was the best player on the planet, you know, who wasn't, you know, was it Curtis? Was it, you know, was it Sandy Lyle? Was it Seve? You know, was it Watson? You know, that kind of stuff. And, and uh, it, it was, it, it was genuine dislike, and, you know, uh, it was unfortunate. I mean, I remember one night, Calc and I ended up playing snooker, which I had never even played. And, and we played uh, Woosnam and, and Clark. Uh, got our asses kicked. You know, Calc and I are pretty good pool players, but I, we had never played the snooker before, and it was a different world. And, uh, you know, we had a blast. I mean, but, you know, the male ego is the male ego. And when you get super studs like that, it, it's hard. Hmm. Well, we'll, we'll go, uh, wrap it with this, but can you tell us a little bit about yeah, your relationship with the game of golf as an amputee and kind of your, uh, your involvement, uh, with, with adaptive golf and seeing the U S uh, yeah, you know, you know that's one thing I've been happy with, uh, you know, lately I've been trying to get more involved with, with the adaptive golf and, and, you know, helping and doing whatever I can, because that's, again, I'm, I'm that perfect figure because of, what I used to do. Uh, so, you know, we're trying to get it out there more. And, and uh, you know, when the USGA started their first one two years ago, it was it was a really big step for our country, getting, getting it together and, and understanding that, you know, you can still play golf. And there's, you know, and this is just an estimate, but there's an estimate of about, you know, three or four million golfers in the U.S., that are in that adaptive world in one way or the other, whether it's a leg or an arm or, you know, whatever injury it may be that to let them know that they can get out there and still play golf. And that uh, it, it's good to have a reason to go play golf and golf can be it. You know, it's hard. You can do some of the other stuff, you know, they, you know, look at the Paralympics, you know, they play basketball and, and they're beating on each other pretty hard, but you know, golf is still golf is there and something you can do you know, until you go belly up, you know, you, you know, even in a wheelchair, you can only play basketball so long, you can only, you know, golf, you can play until you're 70, 75, 80 years old. And, you know, so that's, that's my hope that, you know, I keep trying to do is whatever I can to, you know, open up the windows for, for other, you know, adaptive people. Yeah. Well, we have greatly appreciated hearing your stories. I, I'm going to be placing my order for one of these as soon as we finish here. But your book is, I'm sure there's more stories that we didn't cover in your book, no, Hunter, Hunter of I, Hope. I, I, there's yeah. plenty. <laughs> <laughs> He's, it's called Hunter of Hope, A Life Lived Inside, Outside, and On the Ropes by Ken Green. You can find that at kengreengolf.com. Uh, we greatly appreciate your time and, and sharing your story uh, and telling some stories as well. This was a, a, a fantastic time, and uh, we, we thank you for it. Thank you. It's been a pleasure, buddy.